Well, it's quarter past 10, and uh, I would like to welcome you all to the Halmstad Colloquium series. Uh, the Halmstad Colloquium series is a series of talks by distinguished guests, and uh, in the area of uh, embedded intelligence systems and cyber physical systems. Uh, it's sponsored by two of the research centers at uh, Halmstad University that are funded by the KK Foundation. It's uh, CERES and Kaiser. And uh, today it's my privilege to introduce to you uh, Carly Agnema, uh, who is the head of the Robotic Mobility Group uh, at uh, Massachusetts Institute of Technology, or MIT as most people uh, say. That's, uh, that's the strong uh, brand name, so you don't even have to say where it is anymore. Uh, Carl is, um, you did your PhD at MIT um, and a major in mechanical engineering um, and slash robotics and a minor in fiction writing. So this gives you an indication of um, how creative and um, imaginative Carl is. Uh, Carl has written uh, several books. Uh, one short story that was appointed the best American short story in 2002. Um, and this was in a collection of um, stories which I think it's the, the nature of human romantic interaction. Um, so uh, I, I would actually recommend you to pick up the book if you find it or you can find it on Amazon, but it's actually about to be sold out. Um, and. Um, uh, in that book, he introduces uh, the not so well known Tsiolkovsky's theorem, um, and also how you can describe the love of your next with a Venn diagram. Um, but that's actually not why we invited you here. <laughs> uh, Carl is also, you, fortunately for science, you chose not to abandon the scientific career and become a world, world famous author. Uh, or Hollywood script writer. Uh, instead, you decided to continue with robotics uh, and uh, therefore you're here to give us a talk on the somewhat provocative title of Autonomy is Overrated. Welcome. Well, thanks, Denny. I appreciate the introduction. Yeah, so nothing today about fiction, I hope, or at least nothing that I'm aware of. Um, and nothing about romantic interaction. We're going to talk about vehicles mostly and uh, mechanical systems in general. And uh, the topic of this talk is autonomy is overrated. Um, I'm going to talk about some work that we've been doing in our group uh, focusing on shared human machine control. So something along the continuum between, uh, let's say, manually operated systems where you control every aspect of them, um, uh, uh, let's say, manually. And, um, and fully autonomous systems where the, the, the system is operating based on some, let's say, high-level directive, all right? So the space between those, generally speaking, we can call a semi-autonomous control system. And um, I'm going to talk about why I think, you know, that's an important research area to focus on. So uh, let's see. Here's a vehicle. Now, this is, this is a couple of years old. This is a clip from the New York Times. Uh, but the title of this slide is The Future of Driving. Do I have a pointer? Do you think a uh, laser pointer or...? Or I can just point manually, I suppose. No? Yeah? Oh, okay. Somewhere in here. This one? No? Maybe this blue one. I think there's also a physical pointer. Okay, I'll take the physical one. Well, okay, anyway. Not a big deal. Oh, is this it? Okay, this is pretty old school. All right. So if anyone gets up, no. All right, so, so the title of this slide is The Future of Driving here, right? And this is one of Google's autonomous vehicles. You might have seen this in the news three or four years ago. They have new generations of these vehicles, which look a little bit more elegant. But uh, what do we have here? We have a, uh, you know, a $75,000 LiDAR sensor sitting on the roof. Um, a video camera looking out and processing things like lane markings and uh, detecting pedestrians and other vehicles. Some millimeter wave radar systems which are, you know, not so smart and not so expensive and some wheel odometry sensors and things like that. But, you know, the other important thing to notice here, if you look kind of really closely through the windscreen, you can see, you know, the driver. So, 
Why is the driver sitting in the back seat? sitting in a bed mounted in the trunk, you know, relaxing and basically taking his hands off the wheel. This is an autonomous vehicle after all, right? So that's a good question. Why does a human remain in the loop, even in this self-driving car, which supposedly is going to be able to navigate without any risk of collision? And as it turns out, there's a bunch of compelling reasons why we want to keep a human operator in the loop. Um, the first is that human operators exhibit superior judgment and reasoning. Uh, essentially, you know, humans today still can do many tasks that autonomous systems cannot do reliably. All right? And there are many examples of that. We'll talk about a few of them during this talk. Uh, the second is flexibility. Humans are good at changing and adapting to different conditions on the road or different conditions um, in the environment. Uh, the third is, from a purely technical point of view, the human uh, set of sensors, our eyes and the cognition that goes with it, are far better, in some sense, than uh, any off-the-shelf sensors we can strap to a vehicle. Uh, so this allows us, basically, to complement uh, the vehicle sensors and process data in a way that uh, machine vision can't, can't do today. And then a couple points down here which are somewhat less technical but equally important, first of which is legal and liability reasons, at least in the United States, which is essentially you know, a culture of litigation. Uh, people are sort of, the legal community at least, is maybe licking their chops waiting for uh, introduction of autonomous vehicles, um, just thinking about all the additional lawsuits that will be generated when these acc accidents starts happening between an autonomous vehicle, let's say, and a manned vehicle. So there's significant issues there. Um, and then lastly, the pleasure of operation. You know, people who buy vehicles, autonomous or no, and spend a significant amount of money on them, may actually want to drive that car. So keeping a person in the loop uh, because they want to drive is as good a reason as any other. So a few observations about autonomy. Um, the first one is that, at least today, you know, nearly all autonomous systems require some level of human intervention. We don't yet have a perfect autonomous system that can operate uh, um, based on a simple command and, and, and carry out uh, its task in a way that the operator is completely satisfied with. So autonomy is essentially not a binary state. There's always some level of what we can call supervisory control required. So that's the first observation. The second is that um, you know, full autonomy is, is, is not achievable. This is kind of a corollary to the first point. Um, but basically, there's many unstructured tasks that require some level of human judgment. In the driving domain, a good example would be um, moving from, let's say, a highway driving environment, which is fairly structured, and for which autonomous solutions more or less exist today, to, let's say, an urban environment or a construction site where instead of um, uh, being tasked with interpreting stoplights um, or stop signs, instead you have a uh, roadway construction site where you might have a person standing in the road giving instructions to either stop or continue on or slow down. You know, these types of instructions would be difficult or impossible for, for an autonomous system today to interpret. All right. So the implication is that, you know, for the various reasons that I talked about on, on the previous slide and this one, you know, we're likely to have semi-autonomous systems uh, for the foreseeable future. So we're going to have systems where we have a human in the loop, up into the point where we have capable autonomous systems, and then likely even beyond that. All right. So, so what does that mean from a technical perspective? So as a controls engineer, basically, what, is that, what problem statement can I write down that will address you know, some of these issues? The challenge is you know, how then to formulate a semi-autonomous control system that meets these performance requirements, we can say. Uh, the first is that it should achieve some desired set of performance goals in a manner that's both rigorous and robust. So we want to be able to write down proofs somehow of stability and robustness in the same way as we would for, um, let's say, an autonomous control system, any closed loop control system. But now we have a human in the loop. All right. Um, second, we want to be able to function in a manner that's you know, intuitive and seamless for the operator. And that's a little bit more difficult because you know, this first statement, we could maybe write down a problem which says, you know, given f of x and u, uh, stabilize this system such that, et cetera, et cetera. The second one, how do we write down, you know, given f of x and u, uh, make it intuitive? You know, we can't really write that down. There's no closed form solution 
for an intuitive or seamless uh, control system. But this is, in my own experience at least, working with human drivers and human subjects, this is equally important to have a technical solution that people actually want to use. Okay? Um, the third point is, the third challenge is, we want to have a system that will exploit operator strengths while mitigating weaknesses. Obviously, we don't want to do the opposite. Um, and then lastly, I talked about this continuum between manual control and full autonomy. We'd like to be able to operate anywhere along that continuum. So we don't know exactly where a human operator would prefer to, to, to lie on that continuum, what level of supervisory control we can say they prefer to act at. So we'd like to have the flexibility to operate at many, many different points in that space. All right, well, what will, what will that let us do? <coughs> That'll let us essentially adapt to an operator's preference. It'll allow us to bring in new, we can say, features or levels of autonomy as they become available. And then finally, what it's going to do, um, this very last point on the slide, uh, it lets us kind of invert the whole thinking on this problem, which is not to say, let's develop an autonomous control system and then, oh, by the way, figure out how to make it semi-autonomous. Actually, I think what we want to do is think about it in completely the opposite way. We want to figure out how to make a semi-autonomous control system, and then by maybe changing a setting or flipping a switch, we can achieve full autonomy. So in other words, we'll view full autonomy as really a special case of semi-autonomy. All right? Okay, so um, just a couple slides here on the need for semi-autonomous control, some statistics which I think are probably uh, really unnecessary because everyone is familiar with... Um, um, the prevalence of motor vehicle accidents, uh, certainly less so in Sweden than uh, almost any other part of the world, but there's still significant economic costs um, associated with uh, passenger vehicle accidents. This is statistics from the United States. Not only for uh, manned vehicles, uh, uh, manned passenger vehicles on, you know, everyday roadways, but also in, let's say, conflict zones. Um, passenger vehicle accidents are one of the leading sources of uh, death and injury in the Department of Defense, for example. And, you know, cars have gotten to be pretty good systems from a technical perspective. They tend not to break and fail in such a way that they themselves cause accidents. Uh, it turns out that, you know, operator error these days is really the source of accidents. So we fixed the cars, now we just have to fix the driver. Uh, unmanned vehicles, uh, it's kind of no exception in the unmanned domain. Um, the implications for a failure with an unmanned system are, are certainly far less in terms of um, injury and loss of life, of course, but economic uh, implications are, are large and these systems are actually much more difficult to control for various reasons. So part of this talk, actually the, the, the experimental studies we've done have been in the context of unmanned systems and um, essentially with an unmanned system often you take all the difficulty of controlling a manned vehicle and then you make it harder because you remove some elements of the operator's uh, feedback. Either you remove some of their visual feedback, they're looking through like a keyhole view, you remove some of their proprioceptive, their, their, their inertial feedback, and some of the cues they're used to acting on when they drive a manned vehicle. All right? So it becomes, in some ways, even a harder problem. Uh, forklift operation. So another problem domain. The topic of my talk was vehicles and other mechanical systems. When, we, when you listen to um, this presentation, you know, think about vehicles, but also think in context of other mechanical systems which have humans in the loop. And my argument, at least, is going to be that this framework that we'll discuss can be equally applied to many, many other types of systems, not just passenger vehicles. Um, forklifts, of course, are similar to passenger vehicles in the sense that they're human-controlled, usually wheeled vehicles. Uh, and as it turns out, the source of many, many accidents in the workplace in the United States uh, and around the world. And, you know, you're probably thinking, you know, how is this possible when you have highly trained, uh, highly skilled operators driving these forklifts? You know, how can they possibly cause accidents, but in fact, this is actually one of my favorite videos on YouTube. Um, this took place in a vodka factory, apparently. I don't know if that's true or not, but I guess it's believable. But anyway, one of the leading sources of injury in, um, in industrial sites is, is forklift accidents. So let's talk a little bit about the problem uh, somewhat more specifically. So what we're talking about from a controls point of view is essentially a steering problem to go from some point uh, at some time T0, and we're trying to steer the system safely, by which we mean stably and in the collision-free sense to some point at some future time. All right, so without colliding with an obstacle or inducing instability. Uh, instability here um, would lead to, for example, a rollover event or some kind of yaw instability. All right? So, you know, 
people have been looking at this particular problem for a long time in the vehicle controls community and in the robotics community. And I, you know, my background is from the robotics community. And so as a roboticist, um, you know, we're quite good at solving this steering problem of going, or we can call it the path planning problem, moving from one point to another through space. We have a lot of different solutions for solving that problem. And most of them are predicated on this notion of finding a path, a safe path from one point to another in the environment. And that's illustrated in this figure up here. You know, given some desired position and some initial position, we can find a path. Okay, and it might look like the path on top, it might look like the path on the bottom, or it might look like this last path, which doesn't reach the goal, which, but which is maybe arguably safer or somehow more desirable. So we have many, many different algorithms for finding these types of paths. We have, you, know, you can have A-star algorithm, probabilistic roadmaps, RRTs. There's many, many different ways to solve, you know, this problem. It is, it's, a, it's the typical thing, though, I think. You, you know, the saying, when you only have a hammer, the whole world looks like a nail, right? So. For roboticists, we'd like to reduce everything to this path planning problem. Uh, and typically the way this is solved is we search for through the space of many paths and we assign a cost to each path and then we find the lowest cost path in some sense and we say this is the best path. So the problem in this um, context, in the, in, in the passenger vehicle navigation context, is that human operators um, you know, don't typically like to follow specific paths. All right. Uh, so, driving down the road outside the university here, um, if you watch the cars pass by, you can watch 100 cars pass, and each of those 100 cars will probably follow a slightly different path. And each of those paths might have, we can say, equal goodness, in the sense that they're all equally safe. You're remaining within, you know, the lines of the roadway uh, at some reasonable speed. And so they're distinct, but they have, in some sense, some equivalency, all right? Uh, so humans don't like to follow specific paths, and in fact, when you try to guide them along a particular path, they probably get quite irritated for the reason that their the path they wanted to follow was, like I said, equally good. So why are you forcing me along some other path, right? So this whole kind of um, construct or framework from robotics is maybe not that well suited to this passenger vehicle navigation problem. So humans don't like to follow paths. What do they do? They like to, that we can say they tend to, tend to navigate within uh, not a path, but rather a field of safe travel. So a field of safe travel we can think of as a region uh, in space, in the Cartesian space, uh, which is composed of a number of paths which have equal goodness in some sense. All right? So this is not a new concept. This has been around since the 1940s. This is a figure from a paper from 1938. Uh, the kind of juicy parts are highlighted here. Within the boundaries of the road lies, according to our hypothesis, our being Gibson and Crookes, uh, an indefinitely bounded field, which we will name the field of safe travel. It consists at any given moment the field of possible paths which the car may take unimpeded. Phenomenally, it's a sort of tongue protruding forward along the road. So I hadn't thought of it in terms of a tongue, but if you look at this car, I suppose that could be sort of tongue shaped. But anyway, this is the field of safe travel, right? Any of the paths here can be somehow equally good. So that's, I think, a very powerful notion, all right? This notion of moving not along paths, but along fields. So this is one thing, one notion to keep in mind as we talk about this semi-autonomous control framework. So the second notion I want to introduce is the notion of threat and the importance of this, uh, the threat assessment problem, all right? So, so, so what is threat and why is it important? Well, threat is important because it's going to predicate uh, basically how the semi-autonomous control system intervenes and when it's going to intervene. So when it's going to do something, and then how it's going to act, all right? And threat, as the name would suggest, is, is, is exactly what you would think. It's all the sources of risk that are posed to a vehicle at a given instant, all right? So in the driving task, that can come from uh, basically these, you know, uh, four factors, and there are others, but, but most obviously <coughs> colliding with something else, bumping into a moving or a static obstacle, departing from the roadway, uh, deviating from your, from your specified lane and losing stability even either in a, let's say, a yaw stability sense or a roll stability sense. All right, so part of the task here that we'll get to, uh, a question to think about maybe, is how might we combine these different notions of threat in a, in a kind of a unified single metric, all right? It's easy to imagine these different uh, notions of threat and you can kind of imagine, all right, for each of these uh, different sources of threat, if I wanted to measure them, how would I do that? You could probably come up with you know, various different metrics for doing so. 
we want to try to squash all these things down in a quantitative form so that we can actually quantify threat and then that'll allow us to act on it. So I'll, I'll explain how we do that in a moment. All right. Okay, so this is the, this is the role of threat assessment. We're moving from this path-based uh, framework illustrated in the topmost figure to a more, let's say, region-based or a field of safe travel-based framework. All right, so this is what we're going to do. This is the approach I'm going to describe. Um, instead of operating uh, in the context of pass, we're going to essentially manage our interaction. We're going to manage this semi-autonomous interface, so our supervisory control framework, um, based on the identification and the selective application of constraints. All right? And so uh, you can think about these constraints uh, most simply in the context of the Cartesian space. So think about constraints as bounded regions uh, in space that, that's essentially uh, first define uh, the safe region of the roadway, so the safe regions of travel, and then sep secondly, identify separate regions that basically bound collections of paths of equal goodness. All right, and we'll call these homotopic classes or, or, or bundles of paths. All right, so each of these, from this cartoon here, each of these different colored regions, you can think of as being composed of bundles of similar paths. And they're qualitatively different because they describe let's say, different routes through the environment, all right? So these are defined by the definition of these spatial constraints. We can think of constraints also as acting in the vehicle state space and in the input space. The input space would prevent us from applying an input that would lead to instability, and the state space would prevent us from basically migrating to a point in the state space that would, that would lead to instability, all right? So we want to define these constraints. We want to somehow characterize the goodness of the, each constraint set. All right, to de describe where a vehicle should actually travel. And then, you know, only if the vehicle is in danger of violating constraint, well, then we'll act on it. Then we'll actually do something. So we'll selectively enforce constraints based on some notion of threat. All right. So that's a little bit abstract, but it'll be made very clear in a moment. Uh, it requires three basic components, this framework. A method to analyze threat, some way to plan and identify these constraints, and then some way to actually, you know, do something about it, to intervene. All right. All right, so I promised it would be made clear. And so this is a very, I think, clear block diagram of the type of system that I'm talking about. It has several different elements. The one I haven't talked about is uh, related to sensing, all right? So in this work, we haven't really focused on the sensing task, which is a big task in itself. But let's assume for the moment that we have some of these expensive LiDAR sensors or cameras on our vehicle. And these uh, sensor inputs can tell us important things like the location of obstacles, um, some information maybe about the roadway edge, if that's important, uh, potentially some information about the um, uh, terrain geometry or surface properties, if those are important. All right, let's assume this as given for uh, the purposes of this talk. So the first chunk of, uh, first block here that's important is the constraint planner. This is going to identify basically boundaries, as I mentioned, on the constraint space, and then it's going to characterize the goodness of each of these regions. And this characterization of goodness is, uh, is an interesting kind of topic in its own right. All right. So this is, um, this is part of the work. The second part, now I just talked for about uh, 10 minutes about how I'm not interested in this notion of paths. So what do we do? Well, we're going to plan a path. All right. But, uh, but, but, but bear with me for a moment. moment. Let's find an optimal path through the environment based on the solution to an optimal control problem. But we're not necessarily going to force the vehicle along that path. We're going to use that found path for a completely different purpose. And we're going to use it to basically evaluate threat. All right? So I mentioned a minute ago, you think about all those different sources of threat and how you might combine metrics from each of those into a single, unified, you know, uh, uh, consistently dimensional quality, quantity. That may be hard to do. Let's kind of invert that problem once again. Instead of looking at all the different sources of threat, let's identify an optimal path through the environment. So a safe path, which is optimal in some sense, with respect to some performance criteria we, guarantee, we, we specify. All right? And once we have that path, we can then characterize some, you know, uh, characterize, let's say, the, the safety of that path or the goodness of that path. For the moment, let's just think about the safety of that path. Let's characterize, for example, the maximum lateral acceleration that would, required, that would be required to actually execute that path. 
All right? And what does that tell us? What that basically tells us is, look, if we found the optimal path, and if that path is very safe and benign, we can say we're essentially in a low threat environment. But if that optimal path is in fact quite dangerous, requires high lateral acceleration to execute, we can probably say we're in a high threat environment. So by analyzing this optimal path, we can get a strong sense of the threat that's posed to the vehicle at every, any given instant. All right? So we're basically, basically going to use this, this trajectory that we've generated, this path that we've generated, as our threat assessment mechanism. So we can determine the threat, and if the threat exceeds some threshold, only then do we actually intervene and take some control from the operator. So in low threat scenarios, we have low control intervention, the operator's in control, and everything's fine and then only intervening in high threat scenarios when we feel we need some assistance, the operator needs some assistance. Okay, so this looks something like this just to give you another example. Um, the cartoon shows up here, we're predicting our path only over a short time horizon. This is going to use a receding horizon optimal controller, so let's say we're looking ahead just a few seconds, all right? Basically, uh, looking ahead kind of one maneuver into the future, all right? And when we have some benign scenario, nothing in front of us, we have a low threat situation, and when we have some, let's say, more dangerous scenario here, we're swerving to avoid a large red block in the road. I mean, maybe this is a parked car, for example. Then we have a high threat scenario. And so what does that um, look like in, in a little cartoon simulation? It looks like this. Here's a vehicle at the end of this blue line. Here's the prediction, which is red. It's benign at the moment, so our threat is zero. <coughs> and when it's forced to become let's say, uh, a more severe, a more severe maneuver, which is a higher threat maneuver. Our threat increases, so this is our measure K, which is threat, and corresponding to that threat in this simulation, uh, we're applying some control input. So in this simulation, our simulated operator was just basically driving straight, not doing anything, maybe he was asleep or impaired, and when we had some threat, we were increasing, we were applying a control action proportional to the threat. So in this scenario, the operator didn't do anything, and the control system intervened proportional to the threat and steered the vehicle safely, and assumedly the operator woke up at some point here, and he was continuing along the roadway, and everything seemed fine. All right, so this is what this threat calculation looks like, and then some notion of how it might be used to actually modulate some control input. And this is what it would look like in a more fancy simulation where Let's say you're approaching a slow car, your threat value spikes, and then, uh, you know, so someone's coming on the oncoming lane, and so you swerve to avoid that one too. And this ghost vehicle is actually the input from the operator in our simulated system, which is, who is basically doing nothing. The control system is applying these actions. So, I mean, you know, don't try this at home, but this is just a demonstration. Okay, so that's the threat assessment chunk. Um, I want to talk about the constraint planning chunk, because this is good kind of... PhD worthy stuff for my students who've been working on it for the last couple of years. <clears throat> um, so the question is, how do we identify these constraint sets? I mentioned that we're really good at planning paths, we're not so good at planning constraints. All right. So think about that for a moment. Instead of identifying a path through the environment, we're trying to identify a set of constraints, you know, a pair of constraints on either side of the vehicle that are somehow going to bound a region of paths, as I mentioned, of, of similar goodness. Right. And, um, and I, as I said, it's easiest to think about in the, in the Cartesian space. You know, we can look at this cartoon here, but we can think about constraints also in these other spaces, input constraints, stability constraints, uh, vehicle velocity constraints. And so um, this is a little bit tricky. We don't have a lot of tools for solving this constraint planning problem first. And second, we don't have a lot of tools for then, once we've, once we've identified a constraint set, how do we characterize it? So is this a good constraint set or a bad constraint set? And what does that mean? Let's think of the extreme case. We can imagine identifying s sets of constraints that don't even admit a feasible trajectory. So it may be a constraint set that uh, a vehicle can't physically navigate through at its, you know, its current speed, for example. So in the extreme case, we may identify a constraint set that, that, that is completely useless. And in the other extreme, we may identify a constraint set which has many, 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 you know, an un uncountable number of, of drivable paths of equal goodness. So how do we evaluate um, these types of constraint sets? And we don't have a lot of tools for doing that either. So let me give you an example of how we might solve this problem. I'll give you the kind of the, na the naive approach, all right? The first way we looked at this problem when we started thinking about this uh, challenge 
And so, uh, so we went back to what we always do as roboticists. We started with a path. We said, well, how do we plan a constraint set? Let's first plan a path, all right? So we wanted to move from um, the vehicle's current position here to some goal position. We planned a path using some dynamic program, um, dynamic programming method with some, you know, costs associated with some cells. I think the cost was related to the steering um, effort required to avoid an obstacle. So it's, you know, following this kind of wedge-shaped uh, profile in front of the obstacles. So we started with the path, no problem. And then we can kind of think about just expanding that path uh, laterally, assuming some nominal direction of travel, we just grow it outward until we hit something. And that gives us some type of constraint set. And that seems completely reasonable to me. And in fact, you know, that can work, right? You have some constraint set. We have our operator who's again kind of, uh, uh, well, what's happening here? Oh, we have our constraint set. We're, we're, we have our operator which is doing, who's doing not so much here, as we did last time, and we're applying some um, receding horizon optimal controller, and it's only activating when it's going to violate some constraint, uh, just as before. So this can work okay, all right? So here's one kind of subtle issue I'd like to point out. Um, so even if we started with an optimal path and grew a constraint set around that, you can have scenarios certainly where the best homotopy class, the best region, or the best constraint set, doesn't contain the best path, all right? And I'll show you an example of such a case here, where what we've done now is we kind of shrunk all these obstacles together. So they're very close now, and we have a very, very narrow passage between these obstacles, all right? We can still find an optimal path here, so this is the best path through this environment, but this is probably not the best uh, constraint set, or the best homotopic region. Uh, you know, and so this is a constructed scenario, but you know, if we were worried about things like robustness, uh, tracking, if we were worried about uncertainties associated with our sensing of the location of these obstacles, or our own uh, positional uncertainty, our localization uncertainty, you know, we probably would want to avoid scenarios where we're, where we're traveling through a path which has, you know, let's say, a very, very small amount of margin for that vehicle to travel. It'd be like, you know, if your GPS was telling you to drive down an alley which was as wide as your own vehicle plus one centimeter on, a centimeter on each side, you'd probably want to avoid that. All right, so this is again kind of a constructed example, but actually a reasonable one why uh, we don't necessarily want to start with a naive kind of path-based notion and go from there. What we really want is to end up with something like this, where these are again cartoons, but they're sort of meaningful cartoons, because these blobs are really supposed to represent let's say, boundaries that are composed of feasible trajectories, so drivable arcs by a vehicle like this. So how do we end up kind of solving this problem? Well, I'll give you the answer here. Um, we first start with a decomposition of the environment, and I'll, I'll mention in a second, there's a, many different ways you can decompose the environment, but we started with a triangular decomposition because there are many tools available to do that, all right? And you can do it quickly and, um, and cheaply from a computational perspective. And then from that, <coughs> We construct some, um, uh, some metrics on this triangular decomposition, uh, something like a Voronoi decomposition, although not exactly, but basically connecting, let's say, um, midpoints of the edges of these triangles. So what does that let us do? That lets us get to some simple notions of, let's say, kind of the width, in some sense, the length, of some sense, of these triangles or between triangle edges. And then you can imagine we can easily convert this representation to a topological graph. We can uh, have some notion of cost built in of these things, like these lengths between these triangle edges. And once we've done that, we can do search on this graph and we can find basically a region of connected triangles from where we are to where we want to go. And the edges of those triangles will define the boundaries of our constraint set. Okay? So again, we start with our environment, we decompose it, we put together these triangles, assemble them in kind of the right order, and the boundaries of those triangles give us our constraint set. So that's actually kind of neat, and that turns out to work okay. And I mentioned there are several different ways you could go about this. Uh, this triangular decomposition is not the only way, and for some reasons, you know, it's probably not the optimal way. Um, there's a trade space here. Computational complexity of actually finding these constraint sets. Um, coverage of the environment. We may, for some reasons, want to be sure we're covering the entire environment. But on the other hand, there may be other good reasons uh, to sacrifice some coverage uh, and have a more, let's say, reasonable or intuitive uh, visualization or representation of the environment shown here. This is what we call it, just a tube representation where we're identifying these regions that look more or less like lanes of a roadway, 
All right? We're not covering the entire environment, but we end up with something that's just quite intuitive. Okay? I'll show you an example um, uh, in simulation. So I mentioned how you, you go from the decomposition to the solution. I'll show you an example of simulation of you know, what this kind of looks like for a given uh, representation. This is kind of a trapezoidal representation. We're a simulated car here with some simulated millimeter wave radars uh, picking out boundaries of other simulated cars. And as we're driving down the roadway, we're decomposing it in real time. And in real time, we're identifying the location of these various different homotopies with the number of them popping up depending on the relative locations of these obstacles with respect to the road edges, etc. So we can basically identify, you know, in this case, the four unique ways we could get from our current position to some further point down the roadway. Okay, and this is just an example of um, some various different types of cost functions that we can assign to perform this search. Let me skip this because it's not that interesting. All right, so, um, so that's kind of, I just described a fairly ad hoc way to, 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 to solve this problem of, you know, finding a connected series of, let's say, cells, triangles, or some geometric representation of the environment to identify this constraint set. Um, I just briefly mentioned, mentioned what's, you know, probably a more rigorous way uh, to go about this problem. So starting with de this decomposition, uh, previously we said we can have some, some kind of ad hoc measure of the length of this constraint set based on distances, <laughs> estimated distances between tri triangle edges. Uh, this is all fairly ad hoc and somewhat approximate. Um, what would we really like to get to? We'd really like to have a measure um, of the quality of these constraint sets that would do a couple of things. But one of the important things would be to ensure that each constraint set admits at least one feasible trajectory. I mentioned that earlier. Um, that's actually quite important. We want to make sure that it contains some, you know, drivable region for the operator to, to negotiate in, negotiate through. And so how do we do that? So, you know, a powerful notion that we can try to leverage in this case is this notion of reachability, all right? And reachability is just a, just a, a way to describe uh, a vehicle's physical ability to go from one point in space to another one, okay? And so think about the edge of these triangles um, as being one point in a state space and the previous edge being another point. And we can basically employ some uh, reachability analysis to step backward from the end of our constraint set to the beginning and ensure that from every, for, from every edge to the previous edge, we have some ability to reach um, from, from, from start to goal, all right? And then once we can connect this entire chain, right, we can analyze the reachability from the start to the end point, all right? So that allows us to do two things. The first is to ensure that we have some feasible drivable pass through the environment. And the second, if we can somehow count, uh, examine the cardinality of these constraint sets, you know, we certainly don't want to have a null set, which means we can't reach from one triangle edge to another. We can maybe think about counting up um, uh, the number of uh, kind of reachable states in this set to give some sense of the control freedom um, to, 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 to pass from one edge to the end of this homotopy and some, somehow to measure the quality of this homotopy that way. All right, so just as a brief summary, um, we've got several different approaches to identifying these homotopic classes. Basically, they have, what they have in common is they start with a geometric decomposition of the environment. Uh, they represent this environment through some type of graph, and then we do search on this graph. And then a kind of equal and kind of somewhat more difficult problem is then the question of how do we analyze the properties of this homotopy, right? And uh, the reason we want to do this is because, because of course, we'll want to guide or bias the operator during their navigation. And we have some heuristic tools for doing that, some kind of ad hoc tools, and then we have some slightly more rigorous tools based on reachability analysis. Okay, so, um, so this is kind of the big, that's the big chunk of the work, threat assessment and constraint planning. And then the final element is, you know, once you have all this information, um, what do you do with it? How do you actually interface with the driver? And, you know, we, we sort of pushed this problem aside in much of our early work. It turns out to be quite important because um, uh, from a human factors point of view, if nothing else, 
you know, if an operator is not comfortable using the system, they tend not to want to use it. And when you talk about, you know, consumer products and vehicle systems, that's an important consideration. So there's actually many different ways you can interface with a driver, as you might imagine. And there's kind of, we can think about two main kind of classes of intervention here. The first is an intervention that might be invisible to the driver. We could simply, uh, you know, um, in a steer-by-wire system, for example, point the wheels in the direction that the vehicle should be traveling in, and the car will basically do the right thing, possibly unbeknownst to the driver. That's one method of interaction. The other method of interaction might be through feedback, you know, actually at the hand wheel or at the pedal set to essentially force the driver along the desired path. Or we may want to do some combination of these two things, all right? And so this cartoon illustrates how we might um, uh, uh, have some feedback kind of in the latter method. Uh, here in a low threat scenario, you saw this cartoon before, but we might have, you know, the entire steering range available to the operator. All right, and in a high threat scenario, we might essentially bound the steering range uh, proportional somehow to the constraint set. So this steering input is somehow equivalent to the minimum steering input that would avoid an obstacle. So the operator then has control freedom, but only sort of in the allowable range. So we're basically maybe not forcing the operator to do the right thing, but sort of, you know, strongly encouraging them to do the right thing. All right, so this is what uh, another cartoon uh, a simulation here of um, what this might look like here for a system where instead of our, our sleeping driver, we have a very poor driver, an unskilled driver. So this is a driver model that's basically poorly tuned and it's essentially an unstable system. But when you have this control architecture wrapped around it, again, we're measuring threat, which is somehow proportional to our uh, in this case, our steering severity, or the difficulty of our maneuver. We're modulating our control input, which is now sort of um, being aggregated with our operator's input, being added to it somehow. And in fact, in this case, it's actually stabilizing this unstable uh, control system. So whereas previously, we were basically steering the system when the operator was asleep or unresponsive, here we're basically stabilizing an unstable system. All right, um, so I mentioned this about constraint enforcement and uh, a steering wheel input. This is just a, a second illustration of that. So let me show you some results on uh, some work that we've been doing recently to basically test the performance of this type of system. And we're testing it now in the context of an unmanned system. So a lot of this work we were kind of imagining from a passenger vehicle point of view, uh, the testing we were done was from a teleoperated system, so where the operator was sitting remotely. <clears throat> the framework here is identical. As I mentioned, the teleoperation problem just adds a little bit more complexity uh, to the control problem because you introduce things like, um, well, control system latency, uh, bandwidth reduction between the operator and the, the vehicle, and some limited sensory feedback, all right? But the main focus here was to characterize experimentally the performance of this type of uh, stability control system, all right? So this was a relatively large uh, user study 20 subjects or so, and their task was to cross this sort of obstacle field as quickly as they could without hitting anything, all right? And uh, to make things difficult, as I mentioned, we basically once in a while would take away their vision so they couldn't see anything, and then we put some delay up to a half a second of communications latency just to make the problem a little bit more challenging. All right, so this was our vehicle, which was a um, utility vehicle, which was useful because uh, uh, we didn't have a huge space to test in, and this is, let's say, moderate speed vehicle, not too fast, and sort of um, a little bit less scary. It had some onboard sensors and GPS and telemetry, etc. Uh, this is what our block diagram of our system looked like with all the elements you might expect, the sensing going to some mapping system. And this is our uh, uh, constraint planning system. Uh, and then we had our model predictive controller, our receding horizon optimal controller, which we use for our threat assessment. We had the operator sitting remotely doing his or her thing. Uh, and then we basically modulated our intervention, our control system intervention through this notion of threat and sent everything finally to the vehicle. Okay, and this is what the operator control system looked like. Uh, you know, looked like a video game basically with their steering wheel set and the pedal set and an operator control unit, OCU. 
And their visualization at times was just a direct video feed, and other times had this overlay, and the overlay was basically the corridor that we determined to be the best corridor for driving. All right? And this is, was done in an outdoor field. So let me give you an example of what sort of the, the, the system's eye view looks like. And um, basically, here's the, uh, the direct uh, video feed, and here is, these are LiDAR points. This is from our Velodyne LiDAR. This is what the, the, the sensor is detecting about the environment. These pluses and green pluses are uh, <laughs> obstacle hits. And then these cyan boundaries are essentially corridors that we're planning in real time. So we're essentially, you know, walling off the vehicle from the unsafe regions of the environment. And then we're planning this optimal trajectory within that safe region. And then we're analyzing this trajectory to, to measure somehow the threat. So this was just manually steered, and this was running as a background process, and this is just to give you an example of kind of, you know, what's happening in the workings of the system. And this is the neighbor's barn. This was actually, the testing was done in our CEO's house, his backyard. So he lives in Michigan, um, and there's a lot of space. So, I mean, this is great. We can't do this at MIT. Yeah, that's his neighbor. Okay, so um, we looked at, we wanted to look at, you know, we wanted to sort of, in as fine-grained a way that made sense, characterize the, uh, the kind of the contribution of these various inputs and feedbacks, all right? And so we had four different kind of configurations that we studied. The first was just pure teleoperation with a video feed, all right? Manual control with a video feed. The second, as I mentioned a moment ago, we had feedback control intervention at the vehicle side. We didn't really tell the operator what was happening, all right? The worry here was that basically we could uh, um, uh, confuse the operator or basically violate their mental model of what the vehicle response should be given a particular input, all right? And in fact, that's kind of a dangerous thing to do. So to mitigate that, um, sorry, that's, that's this one, invisible semi-autonomy. Feedback only was when we just gave them visual cues on, on the video screen and overlay of what the homotopy is and also some torque feedback on the steering wheel to kind of guide them in the right direction. And then finally, semi-autonomy with feedback. We, we applied control inputs at the vehicle and we also had feedback, visual and torque feedback at the operator control unit side. Okay, so um, this is what the testing uh, looked like. Basically, you had an operator here sitting in a barn actually full of old video games, but um, anyway, so this is him testing. He can't see anything outside. This is a mule vehicle with a safety driver. This is the Kawasaki driving through the obstacle course. This is the OCU screen. The overlay isn't quite synced up here, so it looks like it's uh, you know, passing through some barrels, but that was uh, just an artifact. And then over here is um, a view of the telemetry that we're getting from the vehicle. And um, you can see in kind of the control systems eye view what's happening. We're bounding off obstacles, as you saw a little bit earlier. We're predicting an optimal trajectory uh, we're characterizing the threat along that trajectory, which is that red spot, the location of maximum threat. We're computing, we're, we're, we're measuring the operator's input in red here, the threat level, and then the final control input, which in some case differs during regions of high threat from the operator input to avoid obstacles or avoid instability. So this is what happened. Um, so the results were fairly significant, a 75% reduction. Oh, I should mention, um, we did over 1,000 studies. So um, Sid, this was one of my PhD students, 1,000 uh, user studies, yeah, before he got his thesis. So this is what you're up against, right? But you've got, you've got, you've got plenty of time. You've got eight years before you've got to worry about finishing your thesis. So uh, over a 75% reduction in collisions. The reason we didn't have, a, you know, we expected a 100% reduction. We expected to have no collisions. But um, uh, our sensing system, we had some... Um, issues with a blind spot in our sensing system and occasionally we would hit a barrel. And so that sounds like a cop-out, which it sort of is, but the reason was not necessarily due to the control system error, but due to a sensing system error. <laughs> but a significant reduction, we can say, in the number of collisions with full autonomy. The bars here are showing as we go from full teleoperation to just feedback to, you know, implementation of the control system to the control system plus some feedback, all right? Um, so the operators drove more safely, and they also drove more quickly, uh, which we thought was interesting. It related uh, to their confidence in the system. They were able to drive more quickly. Um, and so obviously, as they drove more quickly, there was some reduction in the time they required to complete the, the course. Uh, and they drove a bit more stably. 
So we, we measure some quantitative feedback. We also, as I've been alluding to, one of the really important things that we're, we're concerned about was operator acceptance and trust in the system and whether they actually enjoyed using it. So we asked them some kind of um, qualitative questions, uh, which we asked, well, quantitative in the sense that we asked them to assign a score ranging from easy to hard or good to bad on questions like, you know, uh, how easy was it for you to navigate with the control system? How helpful was these various factors? How confident were you in the system? All right. The main conclusion is that, you know, users who trusted the system actually performed better. But generally speaking, as we implemented more assistance and more uh, feedback, um, the operator's confidence grew. This is uh, aggregate statistics. The speed at which they were traveling grew and their perceived control grew and they thought the system was easier to use. So we thought this was very nice to see. And we also observed some learning effects where we did testing, kind of randomized testing, mixing up testing conditions so there was no, uh, there was no gaming of the system and kind of learning how to follow a specific route under specific conditions. So, but, but, but from round to round, from round to randomized round, we should say, um, there was basically an increase in performance and conf confidence uh, the more they were able to use the system. So um, there was some initial transient and then after which they became comfortable and their performance grew. Okay, so the conclusions, I just want to um, present some conclusions then talk a little bit, just a couple slides on some future work that we're doing. Um, this work that we've been focusing on is, is to try to develop a semi-autonomous control system. I think you saw that you know, it's clearly a shared control system, but imagine the case where the threat is one, right? Where we have high threat. Or imagine us just designating threat to be one all the time. What happens then is we have a fully autonomous control system. So I mentioned at the beginning of the talk that I'd, I personally view full autonomy as a special case of semi-autonomy, and that's exactly what we see here. When threat is one, we have a fully autonomous control system that can navigate without operator intervention, all right? And it relies on kind of an inversion of the tr traditional uh, path-based approach to navigation and instead adopts this constraint-based approach. And there's some interesting technical, theoretical, kind of PhD quality problems related to constraint planning, constraint evaluation, and also there's been a lot of um, practical implementation details which have been a lot of fun. And we've done a whole bunch of user studies and we're continuing to do more. Uh, this work, I should say, is transitioned from this type of scenario with a remote teleoperator to a manned vehicle uh, highway navigation, some work that we're doing with Nissan. So what are we doing next? Um, so this whole threat assessment idea, you know, in some ways, it, it's, I think it's pretty smart. It makes a lot of sense. But on the other hand, it's quite naive, right? Um, because clearly, as we drive down the roadway, we have uh, many other perceptions of threat that come not just from these easily measured quantities related to, let's say, steering maneuver severity, all right? Um, you know, we can take into account, let's say, some non-quantitative factors, maybe about the environmental conditions, about maybe things that are even off the roadway that could possibly affect us, etc. all right? And what we really want to know, what we really want to understand is, you know, when is a threat truly a threat and when is it not a threat? Uh, and how can we gauge that from an operator's perspective? <coughs> I mean, this is kind of, I should say, is motivated by the fact that, you know, one of the most irritating things in the world is when, when, when you're driving down the road in your car and your car is beeping at you for some reason and, and you know why the reason is and you just want to shut the thing off, right? You, you understand and you're like, all right, I understand, just leave me alone. And the same, I think, is true for threat assessment, um, uh, for semi-autonomous control. When the operator is in complete command of the car, we may not want to intervene. And when they're, let's say, less attentive or less able to respond, we may want to intervene more strongly. So when is a threat not a threat? The answer is that maybe a threat isn't a threat when the operator is, is aware of that threat, okay? So what we're trying to do is, and this is just a, a simulated, uh, this is a video game basically, and this is eye tracking data that you're seeing. We're trying to understand the correlation between our measured threat, and in this case, this is the first step, um, this is gaze location, right? And so we're trying to understand if an operator's gaze is correlated to our measured threat, especially in scenarios where you have multiple concurrent threats. Is the operator paying attention to what we think they should be paying attention to? All right. And what does that lead us to? Well, first thing it leads us to is some notion of confidence in our threat measure. The second, potentially, um, in the future, I don't think we're able to measure eye tracking in vehicles. I don't think that's really a... Um, 
that fertile or practical an area to go toward. But um, while it may be difficult to measure eye location, I think it's probably quite practical to measure, for example, head location. That's actually not that hard to do. And what that gives us is maybe some binary, you know, attentive, non-attentive uh, uh, flag. And in which case we can maybe use that information to modulate our thread and perhaps more strongly intervene when we know the operator is inattentive and intervene less strongly when they are attentive. Okay? So we're using this type of information to um, both understand and more richly characterize threat and then also potentially in the future um, kind of in, in, in feedback in a, a vehicle system to modulate our actual threat metric. So that's one direction. Um, the second direction that we're working on currently, and I'm going to apologize in advance for this video because it's a work in progress and uh, it's a working system but sort of a mock-up. But basically this whole notion of, you know, homotopy-based navigation, um, uh, you can imagine this as basically being used as an entirely, let's say, new level of supervisory control. Where previously, you know, we were remotely driving the car and then intervening when necessary. You can imagine scenarios uh, so think of scenarios where you have very little bandwidth, or let's say very, very high latency, all right? And you're not actually able to send high bandwidth steering or braking or throttle commands. What you might want to do as an operator is then just select the homotopic region that you want to go drive down, that you want to navigate down, and then let the vehicle autonomously, autonomously navigate within it. So that's what's happening here. This is just a brief clip. You know, we have an operator, the hand wheel position is going to be used to select the homotopy. Uh, and apologize all the artifacting, but that's what's happening here. The operator selecting the particular homotopy they want to navigate down, and then the vehicle is autonomous, autonomously navigating uh, along that particular path. So why is this, you know, useful or interesting? Potentially, this leads us to uh, a system for teleoperation, which can be used, you know, even during extremely low bandwidth or very high latency scenarios. And if we kind of push this to its, well, maybe illogical extreme, but bear with me for a moment. We can even imagine abstracting the environment completely and basically getting rid of this video feed and only transmitting a highly abstracted representation of the environment. And probably this is only useful for very specific tasks in kind of structured environments. But think of a highway navigation task. We might only pass information related to the homotopic classes and maybe obstacle locations. And now you can imagine that the um, difference in bandwidth requirements between you know, sending a rich video feed like this at 30 frames per second and sending this kind of vector graphics style feed at 10 frames per second is, you know, a, probably a 100x difference. So this is kind of another area of um, current work. <laughs> so that's where we are. I appreciate your attention. I want to acknowledge my students who did, I would say, all of this work. Um, Sterling Anderson, who recently graduated with his PhD uh, and was so scarred by the experience that he went and became a management consultant. Um, and Steve Peters, uh, one of my current postdocs is Sear and Jung Hee, who's working on the Nissan extensions to this work, and our partners who did all the experimentation quantum signal. And this work was originally sponsored by Ford, um, and it was picked up by uh, some of the Department of Defense agencies in the U.S., and it's continued with Nissan. So thank you for your attention. Thank you. Uh, we have room for questions. Different types of algorithms that you use, say vision, uh, reachability analysis, control only different types of algorithms. Which, which one is computationally most significant? Uh, so, which one yeah. takes the most overhead? Yeah, that's a good question. Um, well, so I'll probably disqualify vision and sensor processing because those are a little bit external to, to our focus. Um, and, uh, and that's part A. And part B is that our environment is fairly structured. So it's, it's not a, really a fair comparison because our sensor data processing is actually fairly easy, the LiDAR processing. I think typically, generally speaking, I would say the sensor processing is typically overwhelming the computational demands for control system calculations in most autonomous vehicles today. Um, but in our case, within the control system, um, what turns out to be computationally expensive is um, the uh, optimal control solution, finding an optimal control solution for wh from which we calculate threat. So this is, uh, you know, it's, we're using model predictive control, which is a fairly well-known, you know, optimal control formulation uh, over some receding horizon. And you have some knobs you can turn, for example, the length of that horizon, the number of control moves you're searching for to make this um, solution less computationally expensive. But 
let's say we're, we're constrained to, to use linear models over some relatively short time horizon to get uh, a real-time solution on, let's say, low-cost, off-the-shelf hardware. What we'd probably really like to do is use nonlinear models over longer time horizons, all right? <laughs> but the presence of nonlinear models means that um, we have uh, a non-convex search space, all right? We want to use more um, computationally expensive search methods to find, hopefully, a local minima. Um, and we're going to do it over, like I said, a, a longer horizon. And that, today, I think would probably not be possible in real time. So, um, with that said, we do get, you know, a, a, a reasonable solution that we can you know, get reasonable results from. But there is still some, uh, it's a hard constraint there, the computation on the, uh, the MPC solution. The other stuff, the constraint planning, um, is actually relatively inexpensive. The main reason is that um, the tools that we're using for the environmental decomposition, you know, um, uh, uh, constrained Delaunay triangulation, for example, you can find really efficient codes to do that. And then the evaluation, what we've implemented so far is more the heuristic methods and not the uh, formal reachability based analysis. And so that's actually fairly computational, computationally cheap because you basically just compute a cost and then you're just doing search on a relatively small graph. Yeah. Yeah. So, so one of the things that, that, that these systems do is that it, what you think is that um, the system is the one that is the best to make the choices. So, so the yeah. human are in, 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 in second seat in some way. Uh, but but what, what you also talked about was that so, sometimes the scenario is the opposite, that it's actually the human who knows uh, what to do and, and the system it should, should be letting the human take the, to take the role as the driver. For instance, the, the scenario yeah. where you said that there were lane, lane changes and there were a human standing there. And, and So how would you de detect these states? How, do you, how would you know that uh, this is the scenario which is suitable for the machine and mm. which one is the suitable for the human? And how do you yeah. hand over in, in that sense? Yeah, that's a really good question. So I think there's two points to be made. The first point is that, um, so the first point is that you know, if we look at just the performance envelope of the vehicle, right, what the vehicle, the types of maneuvers that it's physically able to stably perform, that performance envelope is um, almost always, except for the cases of highly trained expert drivers, much larger than the performance envelopes of, the, of a typical human operator, me or probably anyone in this room, right? So we can imagine a, uh, an, an instantiation of an algorithm like this, which, as we mentioned, it's modulated based on threat, where we might only begin intervention when we've reached what we think is the typical edge of the human performance envelope. So in other words, it would only intervene when the operators, you know, had every chance to do whatever they can phys possibly do, and it's very unlikely that they'd be able to safely steer the vehicle to safely, to safety, okay? So I think that's actually a useful and somewhat conservative approach to you know, structuring a system like this. You only take over when all other hope is lost, right? But the other question is actually, I think, a trickier one. Um, and I think it most, mostly relates to perception questions, all right? And so, you know, again, not to duck the question, but I'm not a perception person. But if I were, um, I, would have, well, I would want to design algorithms that would identify uh, scenarios where they have, you know, basically um, an inability to, to, to classify or characterize a scenario. So it's not just enough to say, to, to have, you don't want to have a wrong classification, you want to be able to identify instances where you're uncertain. And a good example might be this um, traffic, you know, uh, sorry, the um, construction site, um, or any, any other type of unstructured scenario, right? And in that case, then you want to manage the handoff between the, the control system and the, um, the human driver. I mean, the first slide I showed where the operator was sitting in the front seat, um, and that's because, you know, it's an experimental test vehicle, and so they needed to be able to take over at any time. But, you know, the current thinking, at least in the United States, about autonomous vehicles is that um, that'll be the reality in the future. You probably won't have an operator who's able to sit in the back seat, you know, coming back from the bar, be passed out drunk and have to say to the vehicle, you know, take me home, <laughs> right? So that's not going to happen. And the reason is because the operator will be responsible and, in fact, you know, legally liable uh, and have to be able to take over at any time when the control system needs to make such a handoff. And it would be in situations like that where they, didn't be, they weren't able to recognize the scenario, for example. 
And so the liability would remain with the driver. And so we think about this technology more in terms of assistive or kind of co-pilot technology rather than truly autonomous technology in a sense where people think, all right, I have to, I can go back, lean back and go to sleep, right? So, I, you know, I don't have a, there's, I don't think there's an answer to the question of exactly algorithmically how to solve that problem, but, um, but, but, but clearly it has to be solved, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes? Uh, safe driving is a matter uh, also of communication among drivers and yeah. between drivers in the same traffic situation. Uh, have you included in your research also communication between the vehicles? Yeah, that's a good point. So, uh, not explicitly. So we've done, our experimental studies have all been with, um, with static obstacles uh, for practical purposes. It's very difficult to test with uh, other moving vehicles. So we've done uh, all of our simulation work with moving vehicles. And in those scenarios, what we assume is that we're doing some state estimation of that vehicle based on their previous motion and some motion model. All right, which can be really simple. You assume they're going to continue doing what they were doing. Or you can imagine it's more complex if you have some kind of behavior model of the vehicle. But even better would be to have, through some vehicle-to-vehicle -vehicle communication, um, sharing of state information, which, uh, which is not only information about, you know, for example, what they're currently doing, but if you have information about their input, you can make a good prediction about what they're going to be doing over the next few hundred milliseconds. So what that would do is basically allow us to get better performance out of a system like this because we could be less conservative about uh, essentially the predicted path of the vehicle. Currently we're forced to be conservative and say the vehicle, uh, you know, uh, uh, a target vehicle which is somewhere in the distance at some time t equals t star could be anywhere from here or here and we avoid that entire region. But that'll allow us to tighten that bound, right? So, so the framework that, we're, that, that I'm um, working on here um, admits V to V communication, doesn't rely on it per se. Yeah. But basically it'll improve the performance of such a system. Yeah. Okay, can I ask a question? Yeah, sure. Um, so your prediction is that there will never be autonomous vehicles in some sense. You're saying there will always be a driver. So every application that would motivate this technology that is based on saying, well, gee, it would be great if these hand, well, a person who cannot drive a car normally would be able to have a car. Yeah. Because a, a person that would not be able to drive a car would never be allowed to have an autonomous car. Yeah, well, you know, so here's, here's my, my feeling is that uh, the notion of, you know, what the operator's responsibility is, so there'll always be some responsibility uh, that remains with the operator. But the form of that responsibility will probably change. So I think, in my opinion, the biggest societal impact or one of the biggest of autonomous cars will be in extending, let's say, mobility for, you know, the elderly population or for people with impairments who aren't able to drive vehicles. I mean, sure, for me it'd be fun. I can send a text message while I'm driving. It doesn't really change my quality of life all that much, right? But for someone who's aging and maybe has, you know, reduced vision or, or, or some other impairment, this could be a huge impact on their life, right? But I think in those cases, let's say if this driver is not able to manually control a vehicle with a high degree of safety, they may still be able to, for example, press a button or make some sort of simple um, inputs or controls to, in the case of where they're, they're forced to take over control from a vehicle, at least indicate that they want it to stop safely, pull over to the side of the road, or do something similar. So in that case, you know, the operator would still maintain responsibility of the vehicle, but kind of the nature of that responsibility wouldn't be as great or as kind of broad as it would be if they were, if they were you know, fully manually driving. So, you know, that may seem a little bit um, uh, not entirely clear why that would be so, you know, why can't the vehicle just pull over? But I think a lot of these issues will come back to liability questions and uh, the need to have a human operator in the loop from a supervisory perspective um, to, 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 to have final authority, right? At least this is, this is from the lawyers that I've spoken to, <laughs> this is what people are thinking. You know, it may change. I think there'll probably be um, specific scenarios where you have fully autonomous systems. So for example, um, you know, on the golf course or in a... Uh, a controlled environment like a parking structure where you're going to have a valet parking a car. In those specific scenarios, you know, there could be very well-defined limits of liability, etc. Um, but on an open roadway, I think those questions are harder to resolve. 
So you'll always have a human operator who is still driving the car, even if their hands aren't on the wheel. Yeah. Okay. I would like to thank Carl again. Thank you very much. And as a token of our gratitude, <laughs> hand over something that you can uh, put in your Great. bag on your way back. Very nice. Well, thank thank you. you. Thanks a lot. Thank you.